The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the speakers and not of DOD or any of its components. Take me to the countryside. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Rising Sun Podcast. I'm here today with uh, Billy Janik. He's a retired uh, senior chief hospital corpsman. Uh, you may not believe it, but, uh, I mean, look at this fucking mountain man right now, right? But he used to be, <laughs> he used to be, well, he's still a sexy bitch, right? But he used to be well, yeah. the sexiest of bitches <laughs> in, his, in his uniform, man. He was so fucking, like, clean cut and just beautiful and shaved. And, uh, um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm just happy to be here with him, man. It's one of my old friends. Uh, when I first got to Fitzgerald, um, he, he welcomed me into the Four Horsemen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, and, man, we've been, we've been fucking brothers uh, uh, since then, man. So, Billy, man, it's good to fucking see you, dude. Uh, it's good to see you, too. Yeah, man. So, uh as we get started, dude, uh, um, first of all, uh, so I, I take Japanese lessons here uh, that the Navy pays for, right? And Really? Uh, yeah, dude. It's pretty cool. Um, so there's this, uh, there's this um, program or organization that, uh, that NETSI pays for. It's, the acronym is CLREC, so C-L-R-E-C. It's like center for language and then a bunch of other shit. Right. I don't know what it stands for. Right. Um, but literally they like pay for, for, I, I had no idea about this on Fitzgerald. Right. So that they pay for, um, Japanese classes. Right. And so for triads, they pay for like one week, you get two hours of individualized training. Um, like, you know, one hour on Tuesday, one hour on a Thursday, one-on-one -on -one with a, with a, uh, with a Japanese teacher. Right. <clears throat> and, um, right. and then we also have like two other classes running in parallel that have like 10 or 12 students, you know, E6 and junior, uh, in them. Right. And, uh, it's totally free. And these are like professionals. It's not just like, you know, I mean, they get textbooks, the whole thing. Right. And, uh, um, right. so, uh, so Midori Sensei is my is my teacher, and I told her that we were going to do this podcast, right? And I was like, I was like, yeah, you know, on, on Sunday I'm sitting down with with uh, Billy. He's like one of my old friends, uh, and I showed her like your current picture, right? <laughs> and she was like, oh, Sugoi. <laughs> and then I was like, <laughs> yeah. And then I scrolled to that uh, that post you did on Instagram back in March, where you're like five years, and you're like standing there with yeah. the institution at the helm. I was like, yeah, like that was him. That was him on active duty. She was like, huh? choked him up there. <laughs> yeah, I get that so, basically from everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, but look at the eyes. I was like, look at the eyes. It's the same person. Yeah. I promise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The yeah, the yeah, day yeah. I retired, it's the last day I put a razor to my face. So the yeah. the after my retirement ceremony, I haven't shaved since. So holy shit, man. Yeah. Talk about freedom. That's fucking freedom. Yeah. Right there, man. Yeah. Hell, right. I didn't know if I could grow one, you know, it's, I mean, you, you do your two week of leave shit, but uh, I was like, oh, we'll see. And the boss likes it. So as long as she likes yeah. it, I'm going to, I hope this thing grows down to the ground as far as oh. I can get it. I'm just going to let it grow. So, That's fucking and I live in Kentucky. So, yeah. you know, I fit in. You fit right in, dude. Hell yeah. Yeah. All right, man. So, Hey, Billy, as we get started, man, um, so what I found as I've done these podcasts, like I know you, right? Like, right. Um, but I know you from a perspective of our time together. Um, but what I found is that I don't know as much about people as I thought I did from like, um, like a family history, like, you know, like where I'm from, like, you know, kind of like an origin story um, perspective. Right. I don't know as much about people as I thought I did. So uh, I guess if you can start there, right? So like, like who, who is Billy Janet? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I was born in West Virginia. So I'm just a redneck at heart. Uh, 
again, living in Kentucky, I guess I do just kind of fit right in. Um, <laughs> and my dad got uh, drafted into the Navy because this is Viet, you know Vietnam era. So we lived there for about six months, and then we moved. And we went to, I think, Millington, Tennessee, where he went to school. He was an AQ. Yeah. And that's an aviation fire control technician way back in the day. You know, that rate doesn't exist anymore. But uh, he was an AQ, so we went from Millington, and then we went to Virginia, and we lived there for five years. Uh, Virginia Beach area. He was on three different carriers, the Nimitz, Eisenhower, and the Independence were the three carriers that he was on. My sister was born there. He got out of the Navy. We moved to Tarzana, California, um, where he got a job at Lytton. So we, we lived there and then moved to Hagerstown, Maryland, where he worked for Fairchild, uh, building the A-10 Thunderbolt, which is yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, my, my mom was a seamstress, kind of stay-at-home mom type thing then, and then from there we moved to Utah. My mom went to school, got her nursing degree, became a nurse, and uh, that's where I lived when I joined the Navy. Uh, I, I wanted to be on carriers because of hearing all my dad's carrier stories. So when I went to the recruiter, it, which is stupid, I had a full-ride scholarship to the University of Utah. So I was going to school for free, wow. and then Desert Storm started. And yeah. uh, I was like, man, I want to – this is going to sound totally cheesy – but I wanted to serve my country. So that's, I that stopped cheesy. going to school. Sound, I, I, I know, but you know, people say it all the time in there, but that's, I could have just you know, stayed in college for free, but I wanted oh, to, yeah. I wanted to do yeah. something more. So, yeah. so I went and talked to the recruiter. I'm like, I want to be on carriers. He's like, we'll do the ASVAB, blah, 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 blah. And I could either be a parachute packer. These are the only jobs or a nuke. Mm. I was like, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to, I sure as hell don't want to, pa-. not that I'm knocking people that pack parachutes, but that just wasn't my jam. <laughs> Yeah. And I didn't want to do the nuke stuff. And he's like, well, I got corpsman and my mom was a nurse. So I was like, oh, hell, I'll be a corpsman. You know, my mom's a nurse. Yeah. And then I joined the Navy and became a hospital corpsman. So yeah, yeah. that's yeah. – we just moved a whole bunch when I was a kid. And all those different spots, we lived in different areas. Um, I don't really have a place that I – I mean, West Virginia's home. My mom lives there and all my relatives except for my dad. I mean, so that's home. But I don't really have any – I didn't grow up there. And you know, we kind of bounced all over the place. So – I have high school friends, but we only lived in Utah for six years before I left. So, right. uh, you know, Kentucky is now home. So, yeah, yeah dude. And um, then, so hospital corpsman. Yeah, yeah. So joined the Navy. This is 1991. Um, went to holy shit. Did hospital you join corpsman. One, Billy. Yeah, yeah. And I Desert Storm started and ended while I was in boot camp. So that. You know, that whole little two or three week thing that for Desert Storm, (laughs) I was in boot camp for that. So they rushed us through core school. They cut core school down because they needed, you know, people, especially, you know, corpsmen. And then I went to field medical service school. I think it's called field medical training battalion now where they teach you how to do all the Marine stuff. Yeah. Thinking we were still going to go over there. But by the time I got out of uh, field medical service school, it was over. Yeah. So they, I went to Balboa to Naval Medical Center, San Diego, and worked in the critical care or the cardiac care step down unit, a ward. I was a ward corpsman. And it was cool. I mean, that was a cool job. And then I got orders from there. Went to Twenty Nine Palms and uh, served with Second Battalion, Seventh Marine. So I started my division run, I guess, when I was young. And then did three years there. Met Shannon in Great Lakes. After that, yeah. that's where I met the boss, and I worked in public affairs. And then I went to preventive medicine technician school and PNTs do like food sanitation yeah. and immunization and pest control and all that crap mm-hmm. and worked at the preventive medicine unit, Camp Pendleton. And then I went to independent duty corpsman school right after that, back to the Marines, second time, first Marines. Uh, that was in 2003, went to Iraq in 2004, uh, operation, it was called operation vigilant resolve, but you don't really hear about that much. Mm-hmm. We're kind of the forgotten part of the, the war in, uh, in Fallujah, where I was. Yeah. The yeah. one after that was the big one. But anyway, that's a story in itself. And then I went to 1st Combat Engineer Battalion, did my first ship, the Jarrett, which was a frigate, uh, Expeditionary Ooh. Health Services, where I was a medical inspector. And yeah. then I cut that short, went to the Fitz, where I met you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then Newport, Rhode Island, and at the clinic, and then um, Coastal Riverine Squadron 8. And I retired. Yeah. So that's yeah. the, the quick and dirty. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's that's a lot, though, man. Like, that's a lot to unpack, right? Oh, yeah. So, and then I, I 
you know, Corman get I ate all the time. As soon as I checked into the clinic after I left the fits, because you know they don't, you know this that you're they don't count sea duty being deployed when you're FDNF when you're in Japan because you don't do a deployment, which I know you know this. So yeah. when I checked in the clinic, they're looking at it and they're like, "Man, you you haven't deployed." I'm like, "Man, we're gone like 280 days a year." <laughs> Shut Shut it, yeah, face. right. <laughs> the day I checked into the clinic, they tagged me for an, an IA, and yeah. wanted to literally the day I checked in, they're like, "We're going to send you back to the Marines." I'm like, "I literally just ch- I've been at sea duty for three years, and uh, they gave me a six month waiver, shit. and the day that six month date, they IA'd me and sent me back to Camp Pendleton to Second Battalion, Fourth Marines." And then I spent almost a year with them and then brought me back to the clinic. So I got a six month kind of gap before I had to go back and, and, you know, leave again. Holy so cow, man. That's yeah, crazy. nuts. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, I mean, cause you know, you, you know, better than anybody, right? Like, you know, you fill out your, uh, what's called your post deployment, uh, PB, health assessment HRA, hra or whatever it is right yeah um it's like when's the last time you deployed <laughs> it's like, yeah like, yeah what? you're like uh, like i don't know I just got, <laughs> yeah i just got back from one i mean you try to explain it to these the you know these blue side you know corpsmen or commands at least for the you know the, the medical yeah. community and you're like yeah. look we don't do a let's let's work up for a six-month deployment you, you go out for three months and come in and then North Korea does something stupid and they grab your ass and you go back out the next day for a month. I'm like, it's, there's no schedule. You're just, you're gone all the yeah. time. You can't plan your life around anything. And they're like, Oh wow, really? Well, it doesn't count. So we're still going to send you IA to back to Camp yeah. Pendleton. I'm like, all right, yeah. all right, you know, whatever. I tell people all the time about this story. Um, so it was on Fitz <clears throat> and, um, it was, uh, I had duty. It was either the, it was either, no, it was Thanksgiving Day. It was Thanksgiving Day. I had duty. I was section leader. Section three. What, what? <laughs> That's right. Section three. <laughs> section three, and, section uh, six. That's it, dude, right? That's right. Three of six, three of three, three, baby. What's up? That's right. <laughs> that was the monster section right there, dude. It was, man. Uh, it was. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I had I had duty on Thanksgiving Day. And, um, and, uh, the, you know, the, we got, we got the, you know, the, the task order, like get underway tomorrow. Right. And I was section leader. Right. So it was like, start the recall. They need to be on board by midnight tonight and then we'll get underway tomorrow. And, um, I remember I called mommy and I was like, Hey, what you, and, oh yeah. And khaki ball was the next day. Right. Of course. Khaki ball was planned to be the next day. Right. So I called mommy. I was like, Hey, what you doing? She's like, oh, I'm in Yokohama looking for a dress for khaki balls. Like, stop, stop what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't waste the money. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, hey, baby, we, you know, we're getting underway tomorrow. When are you coming back? Uh, I don't know. It depends on fucking yeah. Kim Jong Il's dumbass. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I remember. I mean, that's just that's that's life in FDNF, though, right? Like. Yeah, I mean, just, Tomodachi, we, pull, we pulled in that day, that morning. Me and Brandon were down in, you know, FCPO birthing changing when the earthquake hit. And we were supposed yeah. to have our hail and bail for Eric Cole that day. Yeah. And then the next day, you know, all the crap that happened that, that day and the next morning, we were supposed to have a get together at our place. We had like 60 fucking hot dogs and brats and buns and shit in our, in our freezer. And I'm yeah. like, oh, sorry, Shannon, you, you, you can eat brats for the next three weeks. <laughs> and we, we got underway the next day, you know, and went up yeah. to Sendai to do that human remain recovery. I and mean, it was literally the next day and we were gone again, leaving all our families in Japan dealing with, uh, you know, the earthquake. I mean, it was nuts. Yeah, FDNF is nuts. I didn't understand it before I went. People don't understand. I heard people talk about it all the time, like when I'd go to um, independent duty corpsman conferences and the FDNF people would come and they would just. I don't want to say bitch and moan, but that's what it sounded like to us. They were just complaining yeah. about we don't get enough support. You have no idea how hard it is, and none of us were like that. Eh, whatever. Yeah. And then you go there and you you do that ride, and you're like, oh my god, man, it is. It's a different world. It is, man. It's so funny, right? Um, we, you know, we all remember, um, you know, uh, March 11, 2000, 
11. Um, for, for me, I was an Atsugi in VFA 102, so it was before I got to Fitz. And uh, I've told this story a bunch, so I won't do it again, right? But I, like the earthquake was something else, first of all. Um, yeah. You know, and then like you guys got in the way and, and started doing real shit. Um, but it, it, it's almost like this full circle, man, for me, Billy. Like, I'm just sharing with you, man, because you're my, you know, you're my brother. Like, um, like remembering that, uh, that time in my life and in, in the Navy, that time in my life, and then now being stationed in Misawa, um, because Misawa, I like, I, I'm like, you know, I'm like a three hour drive from Sendai and like, you know, yeah. the, the, the port of Misawa got like wiped out by the tsunami and like all of the, uh, the actual like operation Tomodachi efforts, like all the helos and the, the relief type stuff was being staged out of this base, you know? And, um, yep. and so it's, it's just kind of, it's, it's this beautiful thing where like, kind of a you know, full circle. Yeah. It's like, that's it. Right. Like I'm, I'm here on this base where like a lot of the relief efforts happened and, um, you know, but, but Fitz, like you guys were out there. Like I remember fucking Z used to tell me you'd see big sections of like concrete just like, dude, floating, dude. I mean, we were, a, we were a mile off, off the coast. See, we were literally steaming. It looked like people had picked up entire towns, just picked it up and then just gently set it in the water. So, we're, you know, we're steaming through, I mean, houses and shipping containers and fridges and cars and we'd be hitting the ship's whistle seeing if somebody would come out of a roof out of a window you know at the top of a house in the water just to see if if somebody happened to still be in that structure so they knew we were coming by and we spent two weeks looking for human remains and uh yeah you know that was nuts i had to pick you know so you get all these young sailors that haven't have never seen stuff like that right Right. i'm not saying i'm like this you know old salty but you know, I, I've done some shit, so I've been around yeah. people that have been killed and, you know, so I had to pick people for this team to help me. So if we found somebody, cause we had to, you know, send the rib out, pull them out of the water, you know, bring them up. Then I had to take pictures and, uh, right. and put them in a body bag and all that stuff. And these yeah. kids have never seen that. And these, these people have been in the water now for, we're going on about a week and a half, a week. Yeah. And when you've been in the water for that long, the body doesn't look like it's supposed to. And it's not just like somebody picked them up and put them in the water. They, they got the shit kicked out of them. So they've got compound fractures all over the place. And you're pick, you know, we were getting little girls, you know, yeah. grandparents, I mean, you name it. And it, it screwed some, I mean, it messed with me a little bit. I mean, you know, your little eight year old yeah. girl thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was yeah. tough, but these kids, I was more worried about all these, I can't, I shouldn't call them kids, the sailors, the young sailors, because yeah. they were having to see stuff that I don't think they ever expected to. I mean, that was hard. That that two weeks for me, I mean, compared to, you know, some of the hardest stuff in Iraq as far as just the stress, trying to manage things because no one expected to be doing that. That was a hard – that whole period was hard for everybody. I mean, not just us. I'm sure for you, it was hard for Shannon. You know, when we left, they told us we were never going back to Yakuska. Yeah. We're like, what? Yeah, you're, we're going to move your home port somewhere else. We're man, we're evacuating everybody out of Yakuza, so you're not going to see your family again. Everybody lines up outside of medical because now they're going to lose their ever-loving minds. You know, I mean, just the whole – it was nuts yeah. going in and out of that freaking radiation plume. Just all of it. Mm-hmm. That was uh, that was a crazy time over there. Yeah, dude. Yeah. No kidding. I Again, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you've seen a lot of stuff, but – um, this is totally an aside, right? So my brother, uh, my, my deceased brother, um, I talked about him all the time when I was on Fitz. Um, yeah. I don't know if I even yep. told you, but he, he, he died a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, fentanyl overdose, um, go figure. Um, but, uh, so he's colorblind like me, right? I mean, it runs, obviously it's a, it's a genetic trait. And so, right. If he's colored, like brothers are going to be colorblind together. Right. And so, yeah. Um, so he joined the, the national guard, um, you know, out of high school, uh, for money for college and stuff like that. That's a very typical thing to do in Louisiana. Like not going to quite commit all the way to the army. Like, so it's kind of like almost like joining the reserves or something but anyway. So, um, because he was colorblind, the only, um, 
uh, career field that they offered him was um, uh, mortuary affairs, right? And mm -hmm. I remember him talking about like uh, because their training was, you know, like they get a call from the local, you know, uh, sheriff's department, like, hey, we've got a, a floater basically, and then they would have to go recover the body. It's like a you know, it's like a John Doe, and then practice the things that you know that they were teaching them on this really really kind of messed up body right and, yeah uh, i'll tell you man I, th I think that i think if, if you were to trace back some of his issues it probably went back to that you know i don't From think that, he was prepared yeah for that. yeah i don't think he was prepared yeah for it, you know um, yeah and yep. so you know if you look at guys like uh like stedham and like some of the guys we had on fits like um I'm sure they're probably like that still replays in their head. Some of the things yeah. they had to do, you know? Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, a lot of it's, you know, a lot of it's, uh, you know, I think how kind of how you're wired, you know, I mean, some, some people just aren't wired for that. And some people are not to say that the people that are wired won't have issues with it later, but, uh, yeah. I mean, when I was in Iraq, you could tell easy someone that wasn't wired for that stuff and somebody had the right yeah. wiring that, you know, you could, you could depend on. So it's just, Right. Everybody's a little bit, they handle it different. Yeah, no, no kidding. So, by the way, dude, if you want to smoke, like, fucking get after it. Like, this is not a... Okay, like, okay. When I, yeah, when I publish it on, on YouTube, I make sure to click the not for kids button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, man, so tell me, tell me about Iraq, man. Um, like, uh, just... I have so much love and respect for our brothers and sisters that did time downrange in OEF or OIF um, uh, because especially like it, it, as we look back on it in today's society and, and all you hear is, Oh, it was a, you know, that was a terrible political decision. It's almost like it's, be it's becoming this Vietnam of our time. Like we never should have gone to Iraq kind of thing, you know? And right. I never, I never went right. But like, there's a lot of veterans out there that were fucking putting their lives on the line in Iraq. And, and now we hear that, Oh, it was a fucking pointless endeavor. It's like, Hey, you know what? Fuck yourself kind of thing. Right. Um, right. So I know, I know you were there. So like, tell me about your time in Iraq, man. You know, it's, it's hard with that, like, because, I mean, there have been times since then throughout the years when they talk about Iraq, whether they, they're pulling people out or putting people in, and I'm sure it's the same for people. That I didn't go to Afghanistan. Um, yeah. I was supposed to when I got tagged to go to 2-4. That's where we were supposed to go, and then we ended up doing a mew. It just made yeah. no sense. But uh, it's through that history of watching it, there are times that you get really, really pissed off at it you're like, what was the point? You know, what, what was the point of losing all these Marines and, and sailors – what purpose, you know, was it for? You kind of have to get over that because if you chew on that, you're you're, you're never going to be able to swallow it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're just you're just yeah. going to keep chewing on it forever. You just you come to the point. It's you probably heard it a thousand times, but it's it's what you did to help the people around you. That's in the end, that's what's important. Um, you know, we have no control over what they tell us to do. You know, you're going to go into Fallujah, and we. We spend three days getting our asses kicked to get into Fallujah, and then they decide that – they tell us that they've come up with this like peace kind of agreement thing that all the, the insurgents are going to give us their weapons. And then by doing that, we'll pull out of Fallujah, and we'll come up with some type of agreement. Well, we're getting like 40-year-old AKs you know, that were in the bottom of the Tigris River you know, for 20 fucking years. So it was, it was a bunch of crap, and it was the politicians and the bureaucrats – they were, you know, playing that chess game, not listening to the people on the ground. We needed two more days, and we would have taken Fallujah over. Yeah. In the middle of 2004, and then the next right. assault that started in November, where a lot more people got killed than what we lost, would have never had to happen. Right. But instead, they pulled us out of Fallujah, so we get pulled out, and then we get our asses kicked for the next four months with IEDs. We lost more people to IEDs than we did to actual combat. Right. So, you know, it's it's easy to blame, you know, the politicians and the bureaucrats for that because Marines aren't built to – I'm going to say they're not built to deal with IDs. They're, they're built to fight. They're built to, to, to go in there and kill a bunch of people and take shit over. I mean that's what they do, 
And when you take that away from them, and then they start getting, you know, blown up by IEDs, it was really, really, really frustrating. And that part was really hard for everybody when we were over there when they pulled us out, because we were, I mean, just right there to take the city, and then we had to give it back. You know, because of this agreement that never happened because we weren't getting the weapons they said we were getting. So that was, that was a really frustrating part for all of us. But you just, yeah. you would go do your job and try to take care of the person on your left and your right. And you know, I was a, I was a first class. So I was an independent duty corpsman at that point. So I was mm-hmm. in Fallujah a whole bunch, but I wasn't running around with the, the line companies. So I wasn't a line company corpsman, you know, the young guys, the young guys are the guys that did some shit. You know what I mean? I mean, they're the guys that were running around with the Marines. Uh, I got you know much more mad respect for them than anybody should ever give me because those guys were doing the grunt work. If that makes sense, no, you know, I always, does. Yeah. I always tell people, you know, that because you'll get that a lot with people. They'd be like, oh, I'm a, I'm a combat vet, and you didn't do shit because you you didn't go to Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever. But you know that. That Air Force guy that was sitting in that air-conditioned cubicle calling in F-18s to drop JDAMs on bad guys so that they wouldn't kill me. Yeah, he was sitting in this nice air-conditioned space and getting good chow and getting to watch TV. But his job was just as important as that grunt Marine with a rifle downrange. Because if he wasn't doing his job, a lot more of those guys would have got killed. And it's perspective. You know, people forget perspective. It's not, I'm, I'm the baddest guy on the block because I was in combat. Okay, cool. You were in combat, but that dude sitting in that air conditioned space, he did some pretty good shit for you. And if you wouldn't have been doing it, you might not be here. You know what I mean? So it's perspective for me for a lot of it. I do, man. I I totally understand. So, you know, uh, rewind. I mean, that, I think that 2004, 2005 timeframe is really important to a lot of us that continue to serve and, and, and a lot of us that have served and are veterans now. Uh, you know, I, I'll share my experience. I, we've talked about it, right? But like at that time, I was on Essex. I was in my first command, man. I was a, a PN2, right? Sec, second class. And um, and we rolled out from Sasebo, Japan, downrange with the 31st Mu um, yep. to put them in for the second Battle of Fallujah, right? Uh, in right. Late, uh, in late 2004. And, um, you know, I mean, it, I tell everybody like uh, they picked me to run the beach step, man, and as a second class, which is kind of wild. And so from probably I don't know September, October of '04 to about February of '05, um, I moved. I don't know. You can look at the evals, but it's something to the tune of about 1,200 people, like through Bahrain, right? Um, either outbound to to roll out or inbound to go to one of the hard ships or to catch a desert duck out to the Essex and then for further transfer to the carrier. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, I mean, you know, we all had our part to play. Right. And, right. Um, and, and, but I, I do give mad respect to, you know, guys that were like, no kidding downrange, you know, um, like getting shot at type shit. Um, yeah, I mean, there's you know, Mark. I don't want to. I don't need to say their names, but there are people that, you know, that I didn't know then, but I know now, or even people that I have known for a long time. Uh, that I mean, I, I did some shit when I was there, and you know, I'm, I want to say I'm proud of what I did, but I'm proud of what I did. I mean, I, I was able to save some people, and sure, I mean, I got shot at and and got blown up by an IED and right all that crap. But then there's people that I know, you know, guys that were running around with SOCOM. Or, you know, those grunt corpsmen that, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I just want to bow my head to them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's humbling that yeah. you, you start to think, oh man, I, I did some shit now, you know, you might've done some shit, but there's some people that did a hell of a lot more and you need to understand right. that and respect it. Uh, right. you, you don't go run around gloating and you know, I'm sure you know this already. You're sitting somewhere, the, the first person th- starts spouting about what they've done, they've done and what they did. Yeah. They didn't do yeah. shit. You know, the ones that don't say anything, those, those are the ones that you got to be like, mm, you know, all right, you know, hey man. That, that guy's done, he's done some shit. So I'm just saying, I've got a picture. I got a picture somewhere. I'm going to find it and send it to you. It's a picture of fucking, uh, of lefty and fucking Pat sitting on the couch in the mess. On, on bits. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. 
I think, I think, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, yep. Hundred percent, dude. You know, but there, there's this weird thing that we do as, as, um, you know, military military members, especially if we've been in for a long time. So we remember that time in our career, and then especially as veterans, we're like we kind of stratus, stratify our experience, right? Like, you know, like the pinnacle is I was a Navy SEAL, you know, um, you know, killing bad guys in Ramadi, right? So, and then you got like, you know, you kind of step it down and, and we can't help ourselves. I think sometimes we like, we, we value our, our contribution based on like how dangerous right. it was, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't yep. think that's fair, yep. you know? It's not fair. It's not fair at all. Yeah. You can't, so. you can't control where, you know, I didn't, I couldn't control that I was going to go to second battalion first Marines and I couldn't control that they were going to send us to Iraq. Yeah. I mean, there's things I couldn't control. I was going to be on the fits and have to deal with an earthquake. You know, it's just, you don't have any control over that. You, you have a little bit if you want to be a Navy SEAL or, you know, whatever. But as far as I can, I can only talk corpsman specifically, but when it comes to orders, there's so many different places that corpsman can go. Uh, you don't really have a lot of say in yeah. what you're going to do. You know what I mean? So it's it's unfair to me, I think, to to blow someone up because they didn't do what you did. They probably didn't have a lot of control over that. You know, hopefully they made the most of wherever they were. But uh, right. you know, again, yeah. we can go anywhere. So yeah, and I think I think that um, so I, <clears throat> you, you may not be following this, but um, this is a little bit of a tangent. I do this. Sorry, dude, I do this sometimes, like, squirrel, fucking shiny ball, shiny ball, squirrel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, we're, we're creating in the Navy right now, uh, a, it's, it's a, it's going to be, I don't know what the rating is going to be called. So, you know, we've got HM, but it's going to be HM something, right? Almost like a FC, FCA, right? Like a FCA just, uh, we're creating an, a Corman rating. That is going to just be for um, uh, you know for the the like the SOCOM NSW community, right? Um, because uh, you, as you know, you know we used to bring people into the special warfare community in their source rating, and so you, you would get right. people that were corpsmen that would you know go through core school and, and get a lot of initial training before they would ever show up to to be a, a Navy SEAL, right? And, and then right. when we made everybody SOs, um, you just kind of got a lot of SEALs that knew a little bit about basic, um, you know, field medicine kind of thing. And so right. we're create we're creating a specialty, a, a new a new rating um, that their primary focus will be to be corpsman for operators, basically, right? Which I think is a great idea, man. You know? Yeah, yeah, so, I think that's a good idea too. Yep. Right, but. So yeah, man. Um, so uh, let's talk about let's talk about the fighting fits, Billy. How that good was that and shit, fits. man? How good was it that? Was shit? Great. I miss it. I miss it a lot. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's hard when you retire because uh, you know the, the people that you were really really close with, especially that are still in. I, I have been in so much longer than than all of you guys, you and Brandon. You know, everybody yeah. that. Yeah. You, you know, you guys are like dear friends, but you guys are still in the Navy and getting deployed and doing stuff and you retire and you just, and it's not on purpose. It's no one does it on purpose. You just, you know, you don't have time to talk to some old retired dude. It just doesn't work that way. Cause you know, you guys got a job, you know, Brandon's deployed right now, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and it makes you miss it even more, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. it's, you know, I, I miss everybody, you know, you don't, you don't, get to see them or kind of keep up on what they're doing because they're so busy doing, you know, good chief shit now or good mass chief shit or, you know, it that, uh, it it's, you know, so I, I do miss it. And I specific, yeah. I especially miss the fits. I mean, that was, I yeah. mean, God, what a command. I mean, with all of it, with, I know you missed Eric, uh, yeah. but you know, just all the patch shit, just all of the, the, the drama and all the stuff that happened on that shit, you know, looking back at yeah. it, it was a riot. You know, even though there are parts that I absolutely, yeah, I hated, but looking back, I'm like, man, that shit was funny. You know? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I miss it. I miss the fits. I was so sad when uh, it got in that collision. I mean, that just, that that damn near broke me, seeing her all banged up. I mean, that was terrible. Absolutely terrible. 
Yeah, dude. Um, so <clears throat> we'll get to that, right? Um, so I, I do want to talk about that because I had a similar experience. Um, but like, you know, I think a lot, a lot of us, the longer you do this, you kind of, there, there's, there's times and places in, um, in your career that are like truly special to you. Right. Um, right. For, for a lot of us, it's our first command. Right. And, and for me included like the Essex, Hey man, the Stressix, the Black Pearl, like whatever you want to call it, right? Like, um, like holy cow, man, like that, that, that's what made me a Seventh Fleet sailor, right? I mean, I tell everybody my first deployment, right? First Liberty Port <clears throat> ever was Patia Beach, Thailand, followed by Hong <laughs> Kong, followed by fucking Singapore, all in like a three month right. period, right? And then we pulled into right. Okinawa to dump to dump the Mew, and Okinawa's its own fucking shit show. You know what I mean? Right. And then, and then right. back to Sasebo, I'm like, fucking sign me up for 50. <laughs> like, how long are you yeah. going to let me stay? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but as special as Essex was, it pales in comparison to Fitzgerald. It's almost, it's like, it's hard to describe how special that time and place and people and ship like it, it was such a special time in my life, in my career. Just, yeah, there's, you know, we talk about like the spirit of a ship sometimes, you know, and I've been on a, yep. road, a bunch of ships yep. at this point. Right. And, yep. and there's something to, uh, it, 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 and sometimes I think you can draw it back to the, to the namesake of the ship, you know? Um, yep. you know, if you draw it back to, to Bill Fitzgerald, right. Like he sacrificed. Yeah. Like, what a motto protect your people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and, and I don't know, man, it was such a special place. Like the friends I made there, you know, uh, the, 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 the mess there was the, the best mess I've ever been a part of. Dude. Um, I mean, because, because of you, because of you, I got to do a ride around Guam on somebody's Harley and do it the entire <laughs> Island. <laughs> Because you you introduced me to that Mariana Island like head chapter guy. I don't yeah. know if you remember that or not, I right? Did, and did, hooked yeah. me up. And, and yeah. his his he brought his bike up, and his brother took me out for that ride, which you know yep. we weren't supposed to be doing. I mean, I didn't even have a helmet. And when we pulled out of that hotel and went and went to the right and started going down the street, there's the XO walking down the street. And I drove by him. I was like, oh shit. Wow. Oh. And he, he pointed at me and he was like, Doc! And I was like, oh man, I'm screwed. <laughs> yeah, but we did the we did the whole come on in, honey. We did the whole uh, we did that whole lap around the island. I got to see the whole thing, and that was yeah. because of you, right? Which was awesome. I mean, absolutely yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I mean, uh, we, we had some good times in Guam for sure, man. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. kind of to, to wrap that story up. Um, so, um, Marilyn uh, DeVarcus, she was the, the manager. And then I forget his name. I think his name is Joe. But um, from when I was in VFA 102, when we evacuated for Tomodachi, because uh, we flew the whole CAG to, to Guam to get away from the nuclear radiation cloud that was coming down from Fukushima. And so we spent right. almost eight weeks in Guam and we stayed at the hotel Nico the whole time. And so I got to be real good friends with the general manager and the manager there. And so when we would pull it anytime fits, which we pulled into Guam a lot, when we would pull into yep. Guam, it was just like, I'd hit Maryland. I was like, Hey, uh, we'll be there in a, no opsec. We'll be there in a few days. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, yeah. she was like, how many rooms do you need? <laughs> yeah, 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 like, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah dude. Yep. <clears throat> I don't know, man. Just that that shift, though, where you talk about Brandon and Lefty and uh, you know, um, you know, fucking Z's crazy ass. Um, yeah. You know, just everybody um, that was there at that time. And, and, and you know, here's the other thing: is I've never the closest thing that 
has come to it is when I was CMC on the Campbell. Um, but it, it, you know, we had our struggles just like Fitz did. Right. Um, yeah. you know, but, um, I've never seen a ship that was as tight knit and it wasn't just our crew. It was crews way before us and crews after us. Like yeah. the, the, the spirit of Fitzgerald is strong, man. Like if you were, a, if you served on Fitz, you identify as a Fitz sailor, probably for the rest yeah. of your life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we went a year, what, almost a year and a half without hitting a, a port. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of crews would have, you know, had a mutiny, but everyone knew that was the game. That's how it was played. And they kept their nose to the ground, you know, and they worked and it was, I mean, it sucked, you know, you're, yeah. you think you're going to get to hit some ports, but it was okay because you're, the crew, again, the crew was so tight that yeah. you just worked through it. Yeah, I, I miss that ship. Yeah, dude. So you you left before we really got into the the preps for uh, for inserve, right? Or we, yeah, I can't, yep. You did, right? Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I left right before that. You heard about it? Yeah. Parts. Parts. Yeah, she got she got wild, man. She got yeah fucking wild on that motherfucker. Like, <laughs> Holy fucking shit, man. Like I, I tell people all the time about um <clears throat> about dumpster chicken. <laughs> Dump I don't know what that is. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna turn you on to dumpster chicken, right? So you remember the you were the floating pier um in Yukoska? Yep. It was the one right yep. there across from SRF. Um yep. we would sit on that pier literally for like like two weeks just rehearsing insert. Like no liberty, right? And yeah. um, and uh, the uh, let's just say the the CO at the time wouldn't even allow people to have food delivered. Wow! To the pier, yeah, dude, it got it got wild, bro. Right? Um, and 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 so what people were doing was <laughs> they were getting Popeyes delivered, and then they would they would like hide behind the dumpster <laughs> at the end of the pier and like eat their fucking five eyes. <laughs> dumpster chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sail- man, sailors, man, they know how to work around that shit. 100%, dude, right? Um, but yeah, it got pretty wild, man. But I'll tell you, so same, same thing as me, Billy. <clears throat> I was in Hawaii when, uh, and you know, me and Mark and uh, Brandon, we're all in Hawaii together. Um, Mark yeah. Dameron and, and Brandon. And um, uh, when that collision happened, man, I think it, I think it was probably a Saturday morning because I think it was a Friday in Japan when it happened. So when the news hit, yeah, it was it was one of those things. Like I woke up on my couch and probably either drunk or hungover, and I'm like, I look, it's like at the top of my news feed, and Fitzgerald fucking collision, and I was like what the fuck, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then when I saw that, you know, that, that we had lost seven sailors, dude, like, um, like I, I, I fucking sobbed on my couch, like sob. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, yep. to see that ship and, and lose those sailors, um, you know, just that whole kind of fall from grace. Yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, it was brutal, dude. Like that whole weekend was, um, it was terrible, man. Like I, I still feel that. Like I, I know what it feels like. I was like, holy shit, this is bad, man. And, um, yeah, I don't know. You know, there's, uh, I guess there's this attachment that, that you can't really explain to people unless you've done it. Like once you're yep. a part of, 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 of a crew on a ship, um, the attachment you get to that ship is something that you, you can't really explain to people, you know? Yeah. I mean, I got it. I mean, the, the Jarrett, the frigate I was on, I mean, she's, we're shaving with her now. Uh, but you know, I mean, that's you know, a frigate, a small boy and it's a different, it's a different experience than it was on a, on a destroyer with reverse osmosis with why well, always had water if you needed it. And you know, we're, <laughs> Fucking constant water hours, you know, if something was leaking, the sealer on the shaft would leak, there'd be a fire, you know, I mean, every day it was something 
on that ship just to keep her from sinking. But yeah. I mean, that was a tight, and I made chief on that ship, you know, so it was, yeah. I'm very sentimental to that ship too. Um, right. because the crew is so smart and, you know, this is right towards the end of birthing wars and, you know, when all, that kind of shit wasn't allowed anymore, but it was still rolling on the Jarrett at that point, you know, yeah. people getting right. taped, taped upside down on the overhead, just, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> that, that shit was still going on. I mean, full out bloody wars and people would just keep their mouth shut. Uh, yeah. you know, so that, I mean, I miss the Jarrett was fun too, but it was a totally different experience than the fix it, this that's was unique all male crew we we had two females um you know officers uh mm. our nav our nav ended up being a female kind of towards the end when i left um yeah we lot we lost one because she was screwing around with another officer we had two here and there yeah they, they would touch and yeah. go but we yeah. had two but the rest sure. of it was all males sure. yeah they yeah. they weren't gonna re you know reconfigure her to to carry females because Right. She's on the edge of being decommissioned every single year, you know? Yeah. I mean, we got hit by a, a fishing vessel because we would do those uh, drug and addiction deployments down in South America, mm-hmm. which are fun deployments. And we had a fishing vessel run into the bow on the port side and damn near put a hole, you know, right through the bow. Because uh, they were trying – they were starting to pull lagging off and – um, the boatswain's locker, and they were literally when they were pulling lagging, pulling angle irons with it, and they just put it back. We're, like, yeah. <laughs> like, we're, we're not going to do. We're, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Give me some fucking duct tape, and we're just going to duct tape the shit back down, and we'll, we'll like, be yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, was, this show? <laughs> yeah, you know, so it was, it was pretty sketchy. Okay. That's kind of what made it so much fun because she was that <laughs> ship was just sketchy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I just, I, I don't know, man. I, uh, <clears throat> and it's not just Fitz. Again, like I said, I have a, a very deep personal connection to Essex. Um, even though I wasn't ship's company on George Washington, like I have a, a connection to that ship because I deployed on her for three years. And like, so I can tell you all about, you know, Gastro Alley and, um, you know, um, getting the double dragon on that bitch like three times. Like, um, yeah. you know, I have this very deep and personal connection to Fitzgerald. I can, I can, I mean, um, you know, I can walk you to exactly my rack and, you know, yep. look places around the ship and tell you about things that happen. And then I have this very yep. deep and personal relationship to McCampbell as well. Right. Um, oh, yeah, I would think cool. so. Yeah. So, um, like it's funny, man, cause, like I literally like slept in the same rack on the Campbell as I did on, on Fitz. <laughs> did you? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I was like, all right, this is familiar to me. <laughs> I'll be able to sleep. I mean, hey, you, you know, you, you made it through and this is what Eric Cole would always say. You know, if, if you make it through a CMC run on a destroyer where they yeah. didn't see your picture, you know, in your, in your whites or your blues on the front of the Navy times, that was a successful uh, tour. You know what I mean? Yeah. I do, man. Uh, and he's right. He's 100% absolutely right. Um, yeah. But it doesn't. So yeah, I'll share this with you, man. Like, the, I'll tell you, like, when you're in it, um, when you're in it, like, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like you're winning sometimes, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you're, like, at that level, I mean, as a PS, I was privy to a lot of the things that were going on on Fitz. You know what I mean? And, and same thing as right. a foreman, right? You from a medical side, me from a personnel side, and, and then plus we just talk to sailors, and we end up being privy to a lot of it, but we're not necessarily yeah. responsible for all those things that are happening, right? right? And that's the difference. Right, whereas and, you were, yeah. Right. You know, I can talk shit about it. I, you know, I, was, I did a... I don't know if you, you watched it. If not, you should watch it, man. Like, uh, I had... I did a Ocho Locos uh, podcast. I had uh, yeah. six six senior chiefs over, right? And one of the things yeah. that I talked about was like when you when you go from like I love being a fucking senior chief. It was like it was fucking amazing, man. But when you go from being like you know a senior chief to a CMC, the diff- here's the difference, right? Like I remember Josh. You didn't really get to work with Josh much, but like no. Josh would come down. He would come down. He was great, by the way. He was fucking amazing. 
Um, he would come down the mess and we had just left maybe PP for T or, or something and fucking Dean being Dean and spouted off and said some wild shit, you know, and pissed a bunch of people off. I'd be down in the mess drinking some coffee and come down like, God damn it, Dean, you can't fucking say that shit. And I was like, bitch, you can't say that shit. I'd say whatever the fuck I want to say, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then being in his position and I've got the senior chief. And I'm like, God damn it, Aaron, you can't fucking say that shit. And he's like, fuck you, <laughs> Dean, you can't say that shit. You know, I'm like, God damn it, they got me. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of humble pie there. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Fucking turn about is fucking fair play, you know. So Yep. Um anyways, all right, hey dude. So what um let, let's talk about let's talk about the elephant in the room. What is that? What inspired you to grow that magnificent fucking piece of facial fucking oh, accessory? This? Yeah. Um you know, when I when I was getting ready to retire, I had finished my degree to be a physician's assistant. So I was going to continue yeah. in the medical field and become a PA. Um, but you know, kind of getting towards the end of my career, I was like, man, I missed like everybody else. I'm not special, but I missed you know the first nine years of Katie every birthday. You know, the first nine years, and I was like, man, I've missed <clears throat> a lot of my kids, and I could go get a, a job where I'm making some good money. Um, but then I'm, I'm gone again and I'm going to be working in some office or somewhere and, you know, PAs, you're just not done at the end of the day. Then you got to write, you know, all your notes and all that crap at the end. And, you know, it's, they make good money, but they, they work at it. Uh, yeah. I was like, I don't, you know, I don't want to do that. I, w- I want to see my kids. What, what can I do that I can see my kids a little bit more before, you know, my boy takes off and goes to college and disappears and I had been farting around with woodwork and kind of my, I mean, my whole life, but I've really gotten into it when I was in Newport. But just playing around, I was like, oh, I wonder if I can make a career out of this and do it for a living. Um, I mean, granted, it's a, it's a living. I am not the breadwinner in our house, yeah. and I am yeah, totally, con- I am totally content with that. The boss is yeah. the breadwinner, um, and I'm blessed that she allows me to sit down here and just make a mess every day and not get a real job. But. Uh, <laughs> When I got out and started doing this, I was like, well, I don't need to shave for anything. I mean, again, I'm, I am by myself a majority of the time. I don't get out much. If I do, it's to go mail something or go to Lowe's and that's it. So my yeah. people skills have probably dropped dramatically because I just, <laughs> I just don't, I talk into my phone every day when I do my Instagram I'll, crap, I'll right? I'll fuck nobody. <laughs> yeah. And that's about it. But I was like, oh, I'm just going to see if it can grow and I think it was maybe about a year and a half ago. I had never done anything to it. I hadn't done the cheeks or the neck or, and it was just, and Shannon was like, all right, dude, you need to at least clean it a little bit because you, you look <laughs> disgusting. So I finally went and saw her stylist and I was fucking terrified, dude, terrified yeah. to have anyone get close to my beard with a pair of scissors. Cause I'm like, they're going to fuck it up yeah. and then I'm going to have to cut it all off. I work really hard at this. And uh, she just just a little trimming, and now she just keeps my neck clean. And if I got any dead ends, and I spend more money on product <laughs> on this thing than Shannon ever has on her hair. Yeah. I mean, it's oils yeah. and bombs and butters, and it's it's ridiculous. But uh, I like it because I I can grow. I got these cool like stripes things that I didn't I know, know I had, you know. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm like I said, I'm just gonna keep growing it. And I got the mustache going a little more handlebar. I'm gonna keep working on that. I want to get yeah. it so it's like spinning. Or I just want to be as obnoxious looking as I possibly can. Because <laughs> I don't have to impress anybody except yeah. for the boss. And she likes it, so I get to keep, I get yeah. to keep growing it. Dude, I think it looks fucking fantastic. I just want to tell well, you Well, I that. appreciate that. Like, Thank you. Let me, like, I am envious of your um, very expensive and high-maintenance facial ac- accessory. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, it's, it's, it's a pain, it's a pain in the ass. I mean, it is, you know, it gets in the way and I caught it, uh, three years ago. I caught this side in a drill. I was drilling yeah. something and I was, I just wasn't thinking about tucking it into my shirt and I ripped this entire yeah. side, filled the drill up with, with hair. Uh, so I'm much yeah. more cautious now. Shannon's fear someday. She's going to find me down here with my head implanted on the table saw. Because the the saw is gonna grab my yeah. beard and just yank my you know yank my head down to it. So I just, yeah. I got to be careful with it down here. But uh, yeah, yeah I, I I dig it. 
Have you ever braided it? Like, have you ever, like, you know, put it in braids she, or anything? Yeah, Shannon's done it, and uh, the daughter, she'll she'll do that stuff. All. She hated it initially, absolutely hated my beard. And now when if I even just whisper that I'm going to shave it, she's like, oh, my God, don't. And then she'll sit there yeah. and play with it. Yeah, they do all kinds of crap to yeah. it. So, yeah. But I've never walked around yeah. with it doing that. I just like keeping it looking like this. Yeah. How old is your your uh, your girl now? She is 16. So she'll be a senior next year. Wow. And then Trevor okay. is 22, and he's going to the University of Louisville um, to be an yeah. urban planner. So he's about three hours away. Um, which is good. So, you know, he's close enough that yeah. he can come home when he wants and we get to see him, which is yeah. nice. So, Hell yeah. yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. You know, mine are, um, I've got a senior, so Millie graduates this year. Um, yeah. and, uh, and then I've got a freshman and a seventh grader, um, all girls. I mean, you know this, right? And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just so funny to see them like, I don't know, like growing into adults, and, uh, and yep. like to see the little mannerisms they have that like, yeah, uh, you're definitely my kid, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. so yeah, back to the beard kind of, um, before we, before we started, I was telling you that, um, that I take like Japanese lessons and, uh, right. And I was telling my, my Japanese teacher that. I was going to do this podcast uh, this weekend on, on Sunday and um, and I, I showed her a picture of you. Right. I was like, I was like, this is Billy. He's an old friend of mine. He was, a, you know, he's a retired senior chief. And she was like, Oh, so boy, John. I'm talking about your beard or whatever. I was like, and then I scrolled until I found the picture that you took back in March. It was like five years since I retired. And there's like the picture of you on the helm of the constitution beside the picture of you with your beard. She was like, "Yeah, eh, eh, tomate. yeah, chotomate, yeah, <laughs> You know, I was like, "Yeah, yeah, same, same guy, right?" So, yeah. for the yeah. listeners or the viewers, I just want to say, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell a story to to emphasize this point. Billy fucking Janik was the most impeccably dressed person in uniform I have ever seen, dude. You uh, that's made sweet. every dude. You made every uniform look the way it was supposed to fucking look, right? And you took a lot of pride in that, you know, whether it was your coveralls or you know your whites or your blues. Like, you know, when when Billy would walk in, I was like, "Damn, <laughs> like, you look good. You look good, motherfucker." <laughs> you know. So to emphasize that point. Do you remember the port call to uh, Vladivostok? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So let me just tell this story real quick. So it was dress blue Liberty. No civilian clothes authorized. We, we pulled the Fitzgerald into Vladivostok. Oh, by the way, it was a total shit show because uh, the CO, I'm not going to say his name. The CO was like, I am not Medmore in this ship to the pier until you put, um, you know, an extension out. Otherwise I'm going to drag fucking screws. So we sat out in the port for like five hours until they got yeah. an extension. And then we, and then we backed down and fucking Bill Shadel was fucking freaking the fuck out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And we find, so we finally get her pulled in and, uh, it's like we knew the watch bill coordinator or something because magically duty section three did not have duty. <laughs> you know and uh <laughs> and uh and so me me and lefty and and brandon and z we're all sitting in the mess we're all in our blues like god damn it man like fucking billy like is he ready yet because <laughs> we always found ourselves waiting on you in the mess because <laughs> i had to go up there and do all the crap you know with the CO and everybody coming in and all that stuff every time, man. So it took a while. Yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, I think if we're being honest, you had to be. Yeah. So I had to look perfect. Good. You had yeah. to look good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're in Russia and I, I've got my, you know, I've got my blues on fucking, I, I'm like a little two stripe fucking red chief. I'm, I'm a nobody. And, uh, 
you know, I, my ribbons are probably fucked up and I'm like, whatever, dude, like, let's go. I'm ready to go, you know? And, and I'm like, God damn it, man, where's Billy? And then fucking the door to the mess opens. And it was like, Ah. <laughs> Jesus. Hold on, dude. And so you roll in, you roll in in the fucking like bridge coat, like three quarter fucking bridge coat with the white fucking scarf, right? With the white fucking bitch. I'm telling you, you did, yes. With the white scarf, with the bridge coat, like with glo- with like the isotoner leather fucking gloves, like. Y'all ready? <laughs> like, and we're all just like, oh shit, Billy. <laughs> You're like, yeah. That ain't right. I'm, man. Like, look, I'm like, look at my little. Yeah, okay. Let's I get yeah, let's go. Fuck it. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. That's not uh, that, that, that was that's kind of the totally thing. Accurate. Yeah. 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 So, I don't know. I yeah. Go nah, ahead. Dude. You're a pretty bitch, okay? I'll just say it. You're a pretty All right. bitch. All right. <laughs> All right. That was a fun that was a fun port visit. Dude, that was one of my best. You know, I, I've told yeah. uh Trevor that when all the the you know, this stuff with Ukraine and everything, uh I'm like, you know, if you could just get the normal just a good old normal American and a good old normal Russian together, they get along great. I mean, we're out there running around in Vladivostok in our uniforms, and people are going out of their way to come up and talk to us. They were nice. Yeah. They were sweet. Yeah. And, and good yeah. conversations. You remember all of that. Yeah. It, that was, I, do. I mean, I really, really enjoyed that because there was no, you're a Russian or I'm an American. It was just normal folks like anywhere else, yeah. you know? And yeah. it's, it's the people that are way in the hell up here that are screwing all that crap up. Because you just get some normal people together. We're all doing the same thing every day, whether it was our military and their military, whether it's me right now and some Russian dude over in Russia that's woodworking. I mean, we're all just trying to make a living every day, and it's you know, it's frustrating. You know what I mean? That was a fun. I really liked that port visit, just getting to see it, and it really changed my perspective on you know Russians because they were just normal, everyday, nice. Nice people. Normal people man. Yeah. yeah, normal people. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the, the, the International Seafarers Conference never happened, unfortunately, but um, you know, I wish I wish it would have I wish it would have happened, but um, yeah, you know, unfortunately we didn't they didn't yep. uh, it, it didn't come to fruition. So Yeah. Um no but I yeah, one hundred percent I agree, man. Like um that that port like that is one of the ones that stand out to me. Even though we didn't yeah, have overnight too. liberty and we were kind of limited to the area we could go, it was pretty restrictive. Like that port visit really stands out to me as like one of my better ones. It was because yeah. it, it was just so it was so much fun, man. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah, I love that one. Drinking yeah. all that the you know, can I get a shot of vodka and it's a you know, eighteen ounce freaking glass. glass. <laughs> yeah, you know. Like, man, that is not a shot. What is that? <laughs> Meanwhile, he sees these like, yeah, and those warm <laughs> beers with the weird tops. Yeah, and just, yeah, yeah. Whew, that was that was yeah, a little dude. tough the next day, but uh, yeah, it was a good time. Yeah, that man. place was fun. Um, yeah, I, I tell people all the time too. You remember this? So you remember uh, 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 Gonzo Gonzalez? He was IC yeah. he was IC three at the time. Um, yep, he was our guy that always played our top side music, you know, for like breakaways and, and all that shit. And I tell people all the time that we were pulling out of Vladivostok, Russia. We had been there for four days or whatever. Great port visit. We're all man in the rails in our blues. The Russians have a band like, beep, 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 like playing on the pier as we're about to pull out. And the plan was as we're departing to play anchors away. Right. You know, um, as we're pulling right. out, da, 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 right? Instead, all I do is win, 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 no matter <laughs> what. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> oh, God, that was you got, funny. You got T-Pain talking about strippers and... 
And yeah. I remember me, I was standing, I was, I was on the flight deck, I was like, <laughs> I was like, fuck it, just go with it, dude. And we did. Yeah, it. just roll just with, it. with it. <laughs> just yep. roll with it, dude. Yep. Yeah, that was fantastic. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, dude. So, uh, anyways. All right, dude. So, uh, switch gears a little bit, right? So, um, you you were uh, one of the guys I always really looked up to and took a lot of notes from um, about the, the leader that I eventually became. And I'm still working on it. I think we, we all are, right? But we all, yeah, <clears throat> yep. You know, the way I saw you, Billy, was that um, you were a very empathetic um, leader, right? Uh, you yep. weren't you weren't a ranter or a raver. You weren't a, a crushed soul kind of guy, um, you know. And 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 the crew on Fitz adored you. Um, very unique role as the, the you know the the IDC on the on the DDG, but to all that aside, um, you know the sailors there loved you and respected you, right? And so I, I guess what's what, like you know if you could kind of frame the way that you looked at leadership or the way that you look at leadership, um, like how, how would you kind of frame that, Billy? You know when I. So when I went on the Jarrett uh, as a first class, and I had I had split toward from second time first Marines, so I had green side mentality at that point. When you're talking like crushing skulls, and that was Billy Janik back then. And you know, someone's boots weren't polished, I'd lose my mind. If I I heard a, a non designated tell a BM three to fuck off, I would just go absolutely ape shit. Right, he's a fucking third class, blah 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 blah, and they're like, dude, Doc, man, it's this in the Marine Corps, you know, this is, yeah, this is the Navy. You can't be talking to people. I mean, I had a guy come in who I knew wasn't suicidal, saying that he wanted to kill himself because he was a a buds drop and he was having a crank on the mess decks and he hated it, so he wanted to get off of cranking. So he said he was going to kill himself. So he came into medical. I knew he's bullshitting, and I was like, all right, dude, you know what? I'm going to help you do it. Like, no shit. Let's let's do this. How do you want to go? I got all kinds of shit here in medical. I can fucking make it happen, right? And I had this, like, crazy look in my eyes. I'm like, I'm going to fucking help you kill yourself. And he was like, dude, Doc, I don't want to kill myself. And I, I'm like, get the fuck out, medical, blah, blah, blah. And I'm screaming at him, and I kick him out, and I slam the door, and, oh, and I'm better. And then the CEO, I got a <laughs> HMO Janik report to the CS <laughs> And I go up there, and I had no idea – what I did, I decided he needed to talk to me, and I sitting in the chair, and he's like, "Doc, did you tell? I don't remember the kid's name, such and such that that you were going to help him kill himself." And I was like, "Yes, sir." And he got up and started to jam me in the chest. Don't you ever tell one of my sailors, blah blah. blah. I was like, "Oh shit," you know, I screwed that yeah. up. It was a learning yeah. point for me that that everybody takes a different style of leadership, and that was like my first major. You can't treat everybody that you're working with or is working for you exactly the same because you're not going to connect with everybody, you know. And the my baby doc at that point was a very kind, soft person that if, if I got upset with him, he would get really upset really, really quick. And I had a hard time adjusting to that, and I finally did, and then he was a lot more successful. And my next baby doc was a greenside guy, and it was always rubbing it, you know, it'll be okay, Smith. And can you, he's like, you know, at that point I was a chief. He's like, you know, you can you can get on my ass, chief. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah. Really drove it home. I was like, oh, shit, you blah, blah, blah. And he was cool with it because that worked for him. Yeah. So I learned at that point that you got to use a different leadership style with different people. The, yeah. You stick with one, one little road of how you do it. It's not going to work for everybody. So that was one of the, the big things for me as far as trying to be a good leader. The biggest thing was that do good chief shit thing that we've we've talked about before, and a lot of that I got from Eric Cole. Uh, again, he's yeah. for me he's one of the the best. He's not one of he is the best command master chief I've ever worked with. And doing good chief shit as far as being a good leader really meant reading, understanding the the mission, vision, and guiding principles of a chief petty officer. If you really if you try to wrap the way you lead around what those words say. And not just read them, like, yeah, okay, I'm, okay, Sailor's Creed, I'm United States Sailor, but really believe 
what that stuff says, it's going to make you a better leader. And I learned that from him, and I tried to give that to everyone else for the rest of my career. I do it now when uh, all these Coast Guard hat boxes that I've been making, I've been making a ton of them for Coasties, which is really, really cool. And a lot of them want me to give them a charge, right? Which is really, really cool for me because, you know, it's it's my fingers still in the game. So I get to give these brand new Coast Guard chiefs a charge. And that's the last thing I tell them. I said, I know it's Navy, but look up the mission, vision, and guiding principles of what a chief petty officer is. Live by that. To me, that is good chief shit. If, if you yeah. do that, you're taking care of the people that you work with, you know, and, and that work for you. And that's, to me, yeah. being a chief in the Navy, that I think that's that's what I attempted to have guide me. We all slip and we all screw up and we forget, you know, but the mm-hmm. refocus yourself on that. I don't think you can go wrong. And I think you can use that for anything else. I think it works across the board for anything. Uh, you know, being a, a technical expert, you know, history, all of it. It's, I think that's what makes a good leader. Whoever wrote that stuff up and thought thought that up was a genius in my book. You know, those days that you'd be pissed off and angry, you walk into the mess, you stand there and you look at it on the bulkhead, you read that and go, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. And if you can remember that, reset to that when you're fucking up or having a bad day or things aren't going right, then you're going to be okay. So that's my two cents. I don't know if that makes sense yeah, or not, but no, that makes a lot of sense, Billy. I mean, I think that, um, you know, Joe Campa really gave us a framework. God, he was great. That, that that's, that's lasting. Right. Also, yeah. a little Corbin, just, just to be fair. Right. Yep. Um, yep. But he gave, he gave us a framework that is, that is lasting. You know, like if you go back to the mission, vision and guiding principles all the time, then you're you're if you can actually like you know align yourself with that like truly as a leader i agree with you man i think that it's hard it's hard to go wrong right um yeah you know and I, I, i'll tell you man like i look at um you know the the you know the do do good chief shit right um yeah I, and you know i use that like a motherfucker on the camel Right. Like I stole that yeah. from Eric Cole and from you. We had t-shirts. Our t-shirts said do good chief shit. Like, um, yep. <clears throat> for those of us that understand what that means. Right. Um, like that's enough. Like do good chief shit is enough, man. Like, um, if you're really, it, it's kind of like we talk about if you get it right. Like we talk about our selectees, yeah. like if they get it right. So for me, when they understand what it means to do good chief shit, that's the moment when they get it, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it means they're they're holding themselves accountable. And when I look at that, man, um, you know, and I'm still a, a good ways from retirement, right? But um, but as I look at kind of like what the next step is, um, I, you know, I, I think to myself like, man, the world could use some good chief shit. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Like that brand of integrity and leadership and know how in the way that we hold ourselves in this very, uh, to this very high standard as, as Navy chiefs, um, like that whole thing, it's almost like we need to share that with the world, man. Yeah. It's, it's, that make sense? yeah. A friend of mine, um, his name's Lauren and, uh, he was on the Jarrett with me. He's one of the guys that, uh, got me through the whole thing and you know made me a chief and a dear friend and when he got out he tried he tried that really really hard and it he couldn't get it to work and he had a very 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 hard time transitioning to becoming yeah. a civilian because he had that mentality and that's the kind of chief that he was but no one else was willing to to accept it to see it to understand it and it i mean it broke him it, it took him Years. It took him years to get to the point to, to get past that, to start to be successful as a civilian because the, that civilian world just didn't understand that. And if he tried to bring it in like to meetings, kind of like a chief's mess type meeting without all the vulgarity and, you know, whatever, uh, it, they didn't appreciate it. They didn't understand it. So it's – I think it's always going to be a challenge to take, to take that out of the, the military and stick it somewhere in the civilian world because it's, it's unique. 
<clears throat> yeah, I know. And, and, and I think that um, there, there's probably like, there's probably Thanks, companies and organizations that are ready for it, that need it. Um, it but like, I think society as a whole is, is too fucking sensitive to, um, yeah. you know, to take that on right now. But anyways, all right, dude. So, all right, Billy. Um, I want to wrap up a little bit, right? But, uh, so I want you to tell me about Doc Sawdust, man. I fucking, dude, I'm a little bit of a fanboy. I think you know that. Like, I watch all your fucking videos. I watch your little fucking Boston Terrier fucking up your fucking Great Danes. Set to do, yeah. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I fucking yeah. love Terriers, man, because they don't give a fuck, you know? No, um, no, then, she like, doesn't. You know, I, I have I have the the Negan bat that you made for me. It's like on display in my office all the time. Um, you know that you know, that like, bat uh, that bat upset some people. By really? the way, yeah, I got some I got some feedback, and, and again, I won't drop any names. That they yeah. were very offended by that bat and thought that it, I was misrepresenting <laughs> the cheese mess and repre- misrepresenting the Navy. And uh, I, I decided to you not even respond. don't know how to take a joke, man. They sure as hell don't. And that, that was, yeah. I was like, for crying out loud, man, it, you, you have initiated Chiefs. This guy, the person yeah. that was upset, you, you've done this. You, he's not going to run around with it and really crack people in the skull with it, man. I mean, come on, it's, yeah, it, just funny. Yeah. A lot of people loved it, and then I had one. It was just one, one person yeah. that was very, very upset with me for making that bet and i was like well, sorry yeah. you know yeah. not to mention it's a business yeah. man someone wants me to make something i'm i'm gonna yeah. make it you know and i yeah. love that bat i love it yeah it's fucking badass what it is <laughs> yeah <laughs> no but uh so t- tell me about doc sawdust man like you know we kind of talked about that that you know how you kind of got into it that like yeah i could have been a pa but i, I was like you know what man i want to do something like i didn't under i didn't i guess I didn't know that you were skilled in in woodworking when we knew each other back on Fitz. Uh, I didn't know I was really skilled in it either. Um, I mean, I was doing <laughs> I was doing like birdhouses and stuff. I mean, nothing. Yeah. My first shadow box was Shannon's shadow box when she retired, and that was in 2014. And it, yeah. I want to make a new one. I mean, every time I look at it on the wall in our, you know, Navy room, our spare bedroom, I'm like, God, I did that wrong, and that's fucked up, and that's bad, and yeah. you know, it's yeah. it's the first original, I guess, Doc Sawdust piece, um, but she likes it, so, you know, I'm not gonna make her a new one, but uh, yeah, um, I don't know, I just, I enjoy it, and I've never, I've never had a class, I've never gone to studied it, I just, I do a lot of, Shannon calls it sitting on my bucket. And mm. when we were, when we lived in California, and I was trying to we were trying to renovate our house, and I was trying to figure out plumbing, and I was looking underneath the sink, and I was trying to figure out how the hell to do that, and I was sitting on a bucket, and I just sat there, and stared at it for a while, and then I'd figure it out, and I go to Lowe's, and I'd fuck it up, and I go you know twelve trips to Lowe's to finally figure it out, but it's always she's always called it that since then that I just try to figure stuff out by just looking. I don't have any plans, so everything I make all these different hat boxes or sea chests. I have nothing written down. I just, and it's not the right way to do it. I'm going to tell you that right now. If you're looking to start a woodworking business, it is not the right way to do it because I wing it with absolutely everything, but I want everything that I make for somebody to be unique. So every hat box, every chest, every shadow box, every plaque, it doesn't matter what it is. I do something a little bit different so that they have a one and only piece that you're not going to be able to find anywhere else and that's the part i really really enjoy uh i've had a terrible day today i screwed up a i made a gun case for a guy that's got an old colt dragoon model 2 finished i was just doing quadrant hinges and i screwed up the hinge and took a whole bunch of the side out and i gotta throw the whole thing away and start all over i mean that's two hundred dollars worth of work that i i gotta throw away and, and start over so it's yeah and i had a piece of glass break for another one, I just bought the glass today and took it out of the packaging, and it's cracked in half. Um, I love you too, baby. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I I enjoy it. I do kind of sometimes miss being around people, but I, I have learned that I am, and I always have been, an introvert, I guess. It's different talking into my phone for Instagram vice actually talking to people. I don't want to go out 
Shannon wants me to go to like the VFW or go to some <clears throat> party with her real estate friends and she's got to take me kicking and screaming because I don't want to go because I don't want to I have my circle of friends you know you're one of them obviously because I could tell you anything that I'm very comfortable with you know I have Shannon my kids and a little circle and I don't like bringing other people into my circle which is not right but that's just how I guess I have rewired myself by accident I guess so getting to sit down here and work every day by myself it's nice I could use the help I could use some help because it's hard to do things all, all on your own um, but uh, I love it and it keeps my keeps my finger in the military you know just just a little bit I still get to talk to to military folks or probably about 70 percent of my businesses with wives or husbands of the service member I do more work for people that are doing something for their spouse or partner than I do for actual people which is yeah. fun it's fun getting to work through making a sea chest with a wife you know for their husband because they have no idea how any of this stuff works and to work through that and, and help them understand it and build something and I'm building things for people that to me is really important you know I make somebody a sea chest I'm hoping if I build it right you know in 50 years that thing's going to be handed down to you know a kid and that's yeah. that's cool I am still humbled and this is what gets me in trouble is I'm so humbled that people still ask me to make them things that I say yes to everything and then I'm doing what I'm doing now as I work till midnight seven days a week and I don't have a life you know I've got a Harley sitting in the garage that I haven't ridden in three years because I don't have the time, you know. Uh, that's the that's I guess that's the big downside to owning a small business on your own, is it takes a lot of work, and it's not just the woodworking; it's the paperwork and the taxes and all the other crap that I hate to do. You know, I don't want to do any of that yeah. stuff. I'd rather just be down here working, but you have to do it. But uh, right. I like it. I hope I can do this for the rest of my life. I'm never going to make a lot of money at it. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. I'm not doing it for the money. Uh, I do it because I like giving people cool shit. At least I hope they think it's cool. So yeah. pretty simple. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I like to do it. Yeah, dude. I'll, I'll tell you, man. Um, <clears throat> some of the stuff that you do is just like fucking intricate and, and incredible. Like, I saw the one you're working on right now that, you know, it's the octopus with all the, you know. <laughs> yeah, the I just, tentacles. yeah, he's all it's done. A huge piece. Yep. Yeah, dude, and I'm just like, and and for those listening or watching, like Billy, um, you burn everything by hand, right? There's not, yeah, um, you don't do like laser engraving type thing, right? Like, no, yeah. So it's it's yeah, a I'll... it's a literal work of art. Whatever you get from Doc Sawdust, like it's a work of art, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have a CNC machine or a laser engraver. I do it, I do it all. That's my my niche or my niche, I guess, is yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. the pyrography, the burning part. So, mm -hmm. which, yeah, dude. another hard part of this, um, and, and I'll quit rambling after this, is the well, figuring out how much to charge people. It's, somebody could go get a hat box from someone else that's got paperwork or got artwork on it, and it looks really nice done with a CNC machine, and then mine, I should probably charge twice what I should, but if I do, I don't know if I'm going to get, because military folks aren't rich, you know? Right. I have to be competitive, right. yeah. Um, yeah. which is why I'm not doing it for money. But I, I do need to work on pricing still a little bit because that that octopus I got yeah. 40 hours of burning, 40 hours of sitting there burning that guy alone. That's not including any of the work to to cut him out, sanding, making the back frame. Just burning is is 40 hours. And if you just do minimum wage for 40 hours, yeah, that's no one's going to pay that though. That's the problem. Right. I know. Yeah, it's almost like, and I don't know, man. We're we're, we're not gonna uh, we're not gonna like solve world peace here, but I will say, like, <laughs> may, maybe maybe you have two two different sides of Doc Sawdust, right? Like, maybe one side is like I, I make mementos and and things for military retirees or they're transferring or you know things the things that you're doing now, and and maybe you have this other part of it that is like truly. Um, you know, you're not making it for anybody except yourself and it becomes no kidding, a work of art that, right. That's something that you, that you wanted to do something you wanted to make that, yeah. that then you can, you know, maybe auction it or something like that. Right. 
Um, right. Because, dude, the things that you do, like, Billy, I, I don't really think you, like, truly appreciate how fucking badass it is. It's fucking oh, dope. Oh, thanks, man. Fuck, man. Like, you're making I appreciate some it. badass shit. Like, it's truly art, bro. Like, it's art. It's art art. And like you said, it's, it's you know, the thing about art is that, um, you know, when you make something, it is it is a one of one. Like, this is this is a thing, right? And it stands alone. And that, that's, that's what you do with all of your, your, everything you produce is, is, is like this, this is a, a Billy Janet fucking work. Right. And right. I don't think you really think about it that way, but, um, you, you probably, you probably should a little bit, man. Like don't understand yeah. yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. And she, the, the boss does trust me. She, she reminds me continually when, uh, I'll, I'll make something, and then she'll be like, "How much did you ask for that?" And I'll tell her, and you know, she wants to, you know, crack me across the skull because it's worth yeah. more than that. But again, I'm, I'm not doing it for the money. I'm not. But it's been a lot harder because just inflation. Shipping is 25 percent more than it used to be. The cost of lumber, yeah. to you know, all of it is gone up so much, and it's hard yeah. to find that happy medium so that it yeah. it, it makes sense. You know, yeah. um, I'll figure it out. It's yeah. take. I'm at five years and I haven't figured it out yet, but uh, I'll I'll yeah. keep trying to figure it out because yeah. I enjoy it. I've thought about streamlining and maybe just doing like sea chess, but then I get stuff like that yeah. octopus, you know. Hey, yeah. do you think you could make this octopus and put a dive helmet on it and make logos yeah. and then my mind starts going and I'm like, man, that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out. Well, I don't want to give that part up. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So just – you know, some yeah. stuff that I do is like straight. It should be a CNC machine, but I, I'm like, man, that sounds challenging yeah. and cool. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna fucking try to figure it out. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. sure, I'll do it. And then I pay for it, but yeah, that's man. that's okay. It's fun. Again, man, like think, just think about that, right? Like think about, um, you know, so you, you heard of like NFTs, right? So non fungible tokens. Yeah. It's like the, you know, it's like digital art, right? Like. Um, and those things have a lot of value, you know, now imagine if, you know, Billy Janik made two, two pieces per year, right? You're only making two and, and then those things are for auction, right? Or for sale, or I would say for auction, right? Because I, I, I think there's something there, dude. I, I really do like, um, you know, and you would get to have the, full creative license of anything you want to do and not what people are asking you to do. Right. Right. Um, right. Which if, if, if anybody doesn't know, right. Like anytime, cause we've worked together on, on a couple things that I asked you to do for us. Anytime that somebody asks you to do something, they say, Hey, I'd like to do this, but they give you the creative license to, to make that kind of dream come to fruition. Right. Like, it's right. not a, out of the it's not the out of the box like plaque or whatever. It's like, hey, I'd like to do this. I heard that, you know, I heard about you. And then it's like a collaborative effort between you and the customer, right? Um, right. And it becomes it becomes it becomes kind of their vision, right? That that they want to see. So I, I I really do think you're you're making fucking art is my bottom line, Billy. I think you're making art, man. Like no shit. I appreciate that. The, I'm going to tell you yeah. something here because I know we need, we're probably need to wrap up soon. Uh, and I, I told I it to this. you. <laughs> I told it th to you through that messenger thing, but I just want to say it openly. The keep doing this, the the podcast, and I'm going to just explain my example again to you that I've been doing like Instagram, like actually attempting hard at it now for almost three years, and. I'm really tickled with the followers I have. They're not a lot though. And then there's people around me that have a lot more. I mean, a lot more followers. Uh, and I get, I get a little jealous of that because if I, yeah. none, none of them are full-time woodworkers. They don't, they don't do it. They do it as part-time. They have a full-time job. So they've got really nice equipment because they can afford it. Cause they got a real job. They do it part-time and they got 20,000 followers. I do this for a living. I'm on that damn phone every day. And, you know, I get 1,400 and sometimes I get frustrated, but there's those, I have that group. I have a group of people that follow me every day that it means the world to me that they do. And I think I told you this, if I don't come on for a couple of days, they'll reach out and be like, man, are you all right? Where are you at? And it's a small group, but it's an important group. And the people that do follow me, they like what I do. The, this big hat box that I made here a little bit ago for a Coastie, she said everyone in her class knew 
who Doxotis was, which to me meant more than having 50,000 followers, right? Yeah. And I think the yeah. same thing applies to your podcast. It's I like the way you have it set up. I mean, I'm hooked. I told you, I don't listen to podcasts, man. I've never listened to a podcast, Scout's Honor, until I listen yeah. to yours. That's the first time I've ever done it in my entire life. I just, I don't listen to them, but I listen to yours because I like it. And your, your audience is going to continue to grow, especially yeah. because you're talking to me. But, uh, yeah, I know, I know. it's, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's going to keep growing. So keep, keep yeah. doing this because I really enjoy watching it and the, the 50 and the next week it'll be 60 and then 70 that watch it or enjoy it and it's going to keep growing. So don't, don't change a thing. Don't stop. Keep doing it. It's, uh, you, yeah. you give a real, you, you put out a really good product that, uh, that people enjoy. Thank you, dude. Yeah. I mean, uh, dude, I, I just want to tell you, thank you. Like you, again, like I told you in the, you know, in the, in the message, like in typical Billy Janet fashion, you came through in the clutch, like, I was, I, I wasn't thinking about like legit stopping. I was just kind of reconsidering like, man, should I go audio only? And, uh, like, I don't know. Like I, I knew that it was reaching people, but, um, you know, again, I'm only four months into this thing. Right. But you know, yeah, like, yeah. I just, I just wish that people would take the time to, to listen. Cause I think they'd really enjoy it, you know? And, um, yeah. And you hit me up and you're like, dude, don't stop. And, and kind of everything you just said. And, uh, those words of encouragement really um, meant a lot to me, dude. Like I appreciate it, man. Uh, because I, I am going to keep going. Cause, and then, and as as fate would have it, um, the next day. Uh, so JJ Gonzalez, he's uh, um, he, he's one of my mentors, and he got picked up to go be the fleet mass chief over in Europe. And so I, I had, you know, I sent him a message and. I mean, so he's like a step away from Mick Pine, right? I sent him a message like, hey, JJ, congrats, bro. Fucking, you know, you know, no better person for the job, blah, 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 right? And uh, he was like, thanks, Dean. Um, he's like, I love your podcast, right? I was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I'm not in trouble yet. Uh, he knows about so it. That's I'm not good. in trouble, so. That's that's a good thing. Uh, maybe maybe that people is, yep. will appreciate the fact that I'm doing it. Yeah. You know? So yeah, um, yeah. You know. So, anyways. Well, you, right, you have to get the game. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah, I like to talk. You know, it was yeah. funny, man. We were doing like the we were doing like the circle of trust thing during the season, and uh, and like you know, like selectees were telling genuine things that you know how that goes, right? And uh, yeah, and, and one of them walks up to me. And he's like, he's like CMC. You'd like to hear your fucking self talk. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, yes. Like, yes, I do. That's fair. <laughs> I was like, that's fair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So, all right, dude. Hey, man. I love you. No shit, bro. I love you too, brother. All right, man. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll do this again, man. Uh, there, okay. There's going to be certain people that I think are going to be kind of returning, uh, uh, return guests and, and certainly we'll, we'll do this again, man. We'll just, we'll pick a date and, uh, here, you know, here in four or six months or something and we'll do it again. Okay. Okay. That sounds great. All right. All right, man. Love you, bro. All right. Love you too.